I'm Pat Cohn, and this is another unedited uh, and generally unscripted philosophy video. So in this video we're going to talk a bit about uh, racism and efforts that have been made to deal with it, and in particular uh, some statements that Morgan Freeman made uh, that uh, on the topic of racism and Black History Month. But before we get into this, I realized that there was a small, small detail that uh, I meant to include in my last video that I never got around to. And that's the notion of kind of arguments that can bring us, uh, bring us to conclusions on topics where they're not axiomatic. And that I generally advocate empiricism as, as the strongest mental explorative uh, model for factual questions, whether it's in the full-blown scientific sense with peer review and all the social stuff that goes along with that, or just a kind of personal empiricism. Uh, those, that method is great for factual questions. It's not the only method, and if we can't do empiricism, or if, we're just, if we don't have enough data, then we might use intuition and, uh, and do all sorts of, uh, all sorts of modeling, uh, mental modeling to figure out what the most likely characteristic is, or most likely truth is. But in general, we use empiricism for that. Um, in, in other realms that aren't, uh, in, that, that aren't dealing with empirical questions, like what is, uh, what philosophical view should we have? What is moral? What is ethical? We instead look to aesthetic arguments, arguments that seem to work with our emotional intuitions, uh, with, um, with our current sets of values, that seem to resolve or at least explain um, situations and capture their uh, any of their dynamics that are causing tension in, uh, in us uh, and that turn appropriately on details of cases. Um, <clears throat> aesthetic arguments are great for philosophy, they're great for morality, and really they're one of the, they're the they're the tool that we generally use when we don't have anything more solid. And philosophy, uh, undifferentiated uh, philosophy, or small p philosophy, they, they generally make decent use of aesthetic arguments. And I'm not saying literally this is pretty, but rather this is a intel uh, intellectually attractive way to think about um, this topic. So in any case, yeah, I just want to to mention that because it was in the list of things that I was thinking about when I was uh, uh, deciding what to talk about in the last video, uh, but I uh, forgot to get to it, so maybe I should be doing a little bit more planning, although I don't want to get too planned, because one of the, th one of the things that I'd like to capture with this is the feeling of having a philosophical conversation. Now, it's obviously not a full conversation because it is just stuff flowing off the top of my head. But the casualness, I think, uh, is a positive feature. And if you want something more more careful, uh, I do uh, post uh, in various other forms. I, I have a blog, I post on Google+, I use Twitter, um, I'm present on a number of forums, and with each of them I have a little bit of a different um, different set of standards for how, or for, for what I'm doing on that medium. So in any case, let's, let's talk about, um, about uh, racism. And I don't remember how much of this I, I covered in my, uh, in my first real video uh, that was kind of an overview of my uh, of my thoughts on various matters in philosophy and politics. Um, so in, in general, when we're dealing with issues of institutional abuse that were long standing, that were damaging, uh, 
particularly like racist ideas or sexist ideas in government and in business and in other types of social relations. Um, ideally, we're trying to move beyond that. We're trying to create a society where generally somebody uh, could ignore your uh, your ethnicity for, mo uh, for most matters. They can ignore um, your, your sex for most matters. They, uh, these things just would cease to matter. You can, regardless of your background, fill most roles in society well and uh, comfortably. Uh, not necessarily, uh, it's not necessarily saying that you'll be comfortable from any possible identity that you bring into the mix, but rather any of these, uh, the, the racial categories that, that you bring into the mix won't disqualify you from uh, as, as reasonable a, a life as anybody else. <clears throat> now, it doesn't mean that people won't challenge you. It doesn't mean people won't make fun of you. It doesn't mean that you will always have as much dignity as you like or recognition in whatever sense that, uh, that you like. If you really care that you're from Tamil Nadu and you demand recognition of it from everyone and you get angry when people you don't know won't come up and immediately figure out based on your accent or your look or, or whatever that you're from Tamil Nadu or if they just don't care then you're in the wrong there. Uh, you don't get to make people care and give you specific attention or to validate your identities but we would also expect that nobody would decide not to hire you because you're from Tamil Nadu. Or, uh, nobody would decide that um, that you're not suitable for certain types of jobs or I don't want any of those people marrying into the family or uh, things along those lines. Um, that uh, So that's setting up the standard that we're aiming for here. Uh, the, the standard is that it shouldn't matter uh, what most of these specifics are. You should be able to live a reasonable life. You're not not guaranteed validation of any kind or recognition of any kind. But but people will just ignore uh, these things rather than being hostile to them. So looking into that, so that's a nice theory. Now with any nice theory. Uh, there's the question of how do we actually make it real and that's uh, it's not always a question of moving straight towards the theory uh, or straight towards our, our theoretical goal like let's take for example an idea that I generally hold that any norm that you would create to deal with these problems should um, should not create new discrimination Generally, I think that's a fantastic norm to aim for. And, and uh, paired with another norm that I, I believe in, any social criticism that you lay of a person in one group for being sexist or racist or whatever, you should be equally willing to lay that same criticism to someone of another group, even if you think that group has been traditionally disadvantaged. Because we're not aiming to redress wrongs by punishing a people, we're aiming to redress wrongs by looking for particularly problematic behavior that, um, that has no place in the world that we're uh, we hope to create. Uh, and, and yeah, so we're not, we're not generally accepting double standards. We don't want to make them. We think that they're damaging. Uh, and they, they fail one of the important tests of any social justice movement in that if it actually operated internally by the rules of the world that it would aim to create, would it survive or not? So, great ideals. There are some exceptions. Uh, and I, I think that the exceptions need to be well argued and they need to be limited in time. We're not aiming to create any type of permanent exception or even any particularly long-term exception. We need to consider these exceptions to be temporary things that we're willing to do for a limited amount of time. And I'm not meaning the type of limited where we're talking uh, like copyright in the United States where we just keep on tacking on more time whenever 
the deadline hits. I'm thinking more we have specific things that we're looking for that almost anybody could recognize when we've met them, uh, after which we'll peel back the measure. And affirm affirmative action is a great example. I support affirmative action in a limited sense. I support affirmative action in educational institutions. And I don't think that it should necessarily be the strongest criteria that were, uh, that universities or other schools use, but it's okay for it to be a criteria. And that's, that is something that goes against one of those principles that I laid out above. And there's a tension. There's a tension between what, uh, what I hope that policy would achieve and the, these guidelines that I've, I've set for myself and other people have set for themselves here. And so I, uh, I support for a limited time affirmative action in, uh, in educational uh, ven uh, venues because I think that it's necessary to both provide vestedness in society, uh, by which I mean that people of, of various uh, types in life, they feel that their categories, particularly those that they don't have any choice over, because there are voluntary categories like religion, uh, but, but there are involuntary categories like race. Pe uh, people of various races should not feel that they don't have the potential in society uh, to, to function, to explore, to have opportunities. They shouldn't feel that their, their race is an obstacle to that or their sex is an obstacle to that. Uh, to that. And uh, providing them access to education prov uh, makes for a lot of easy examples of people uh, who are in various minorities who go on to great success. Now this isn't a guarantee that everybody will go on to great success, but if people feel that the system is stacked against them and, it, and that it has written them off no matter how hard they work or no matter how smart they are, no matter how great an idea they have, no matter all these things that people attempt to uh, bring to the table when it comes to various types of employment, if they feel that the door is closed from the beginning, that's a very dangerous thing in society. Uh, it's dangerous in one sense because it means that they won't bother trying to, uh, to reach their potential, whether they can or not. If they don't feel they can, they won't try, or at least many of them won't try. And secondly, it, uh, by becoming unvested enough in a society, you lose the normal inhibitions that that keep uh, that that keep it reasonable for you to um, to constructively participate in a society. You're not likely to vote if you think that no matter what um, the the system is not built for people like you. It's built for uh, people who are unlike you, who are divided from you by categories you can't change. You're not going to vote. You're you might be more likely to do crime. You might uh, you might be less likely to participate in civic institutions. Um, less likely to, to go to debates. Less likely to attend planning boards. Uh, there are all sorts of areas of partic participation in society where if you don't um, if you don't feel that the system is even potentially about you. You'll just toss up your hands and walk away. And that hurts society, and it hurts you. And we don't want to write off entire categories of people based on unchangeable, uh, based on unchangeable facts about them. We have, it needs to be clear that those opportunities are there. Now this, uh, again, this, this is only part of the puzzle because there are other things unrelated to anti-sexism, anti-racism that need to be there to make those opportunities fully real. We need a much better educational system. We need job retraining programs. Um, 
we need probably better protections in the workplace against uh, against all sorts of pressure that employers can uh, place on employees. But those are that's getting a little bit off topic. Doesn't mean it's not important, but we're not going to uh, talk about it in more detail right now. But yeah, that uh, so affirmative. Uh, uh, I I don't. I don't support affirmative action outside of education. Uh, I, I think that education actually is transformative and it's symbolic and it should be sufficient to, uh, to solve the, uh, the problems that resulted from uh, long, uh, many, many years of institutionalized racism and sexism. In the long run, it'll solve them. And uh, I also said I support it for a limited time, which means that we should be figuring out when affirmative action is no longer necessary. And the metric that I suggest is that when, when people, uh, when we have reasonable assurance that somebody without the help of affirmative action will have a roughly equal opportunity um, ignoring cultural factors, but if if you take culture as a constant, which we can't actually, but uh, but this is we're we're trying to approximate this uh, this metric. If somebody, regardless of their skin color or gender or facial features, um, if they actually have a shot, uh, a, a relatively even shot at doing well in society without those programs then we don't need those programs anymore and we should be happy to discard them because any programs like these have a cost. In this case, I think it's a cost worth paying, but it's still a cost. It's still doing one injustice to lessen a greater injustice. And we're willing to do that in society. We always have trade-offs. It's just part of having many goals. We, we can't avoid either by neglect or by action hurting some of our values. The opportunity costs are always there. Any any person's being neglected and failing to reach their potential or at least having a good shot at it, that's a, that's a failing of ours. Um, but we can't we can't solve every problem because each uh, because these these values compete with each other, but yes, as, as I said, I uh, I support affirmative action um, for a limited time in the educational venue. So let's let's move on to um, uh, Morgan Freeman's uh, statements, because there it's not that I think that necessarily Morgan Freeman is the uh, the only interesting person worth talking about. It's not because he's black. Uh, I mean. Uh, he is a pretty cool guy, um, and he has a fan uh, one of the better uh, one of the, uh, the better voices in Hollywood. Uh, but it's not actually about him. It's just that he happens to cover in his uh, statements that were kind of controversial, although not deeply controversial, a number of the topics that um, that are worth uh, worth considering. So one of the things that he suggested is that the way that we deal with racism is that we learn not to see it. Uh, he said something akin to, um, I would like it if you didn't see me as a black man and I won't see you as a white man. And I think that there's something very healthy about this and that if we learn to stop paying attention to these distinctions, uh, they do greatly diminish and it's certainly an end goal. Um, and not only that, I mean, it's, it's not true for gender. There, there are only two genders, but there are many races uh, in the world, but they also blend smoothly into each other. Um, if you come from a, a multi-ethnic family, uh, theoretically, if, if you were to decide that the races are very concrete things and you're either this or that or you're half this or a quarter that, Eventually, all these fractions are uh, are going to feel a little bit weird compared to all of the natural variation within any of the races. Races are 
more descriptions of smooth blends between types of people rather than concrete and eternal categories. And uh, and learning not to see them, deciding they don't matter, uh, that effectively eliminates the, the possibility of racism from someone who has actually managed to do that. Now, I don't know if we all completely manage to do that, but the, the more we can get into that mindset, uh, the healthier. Um, so that part of it is good. Uh, the, the thing, the nuance that I would add to it, and I'm, I'm not certain whether Morgan Freeman would agree with me or disagree with me on, on this, is that we still need to keep our eye out for uh, abuses. We still need to look for, uh, for racism and try and eliminate it when we see it. And in particular, I would suggest that we, uh, we focus on people who are deciding, as, as I said earlier, not to hire someone because of their race or their sex. Um, that needs to stop. And it, if you see it, you should first make an effort to convince the person to stop doing that. But if they do keep on doing that, you should probably report it. Um, report it to their boss, or if they're, if they're uh, a company owner, you should make a complaint. Um, you should certainly shame them if, you, if you're not working for them. Just don't let that stuff go, because that stuff is poisonous to a multi-ethnic uh, multi community. And I mean, I guess all, uh, uh, all communities and workplaces, or at least most of them nowadays, they're at least theoretically open to people of either gender, and you don't want people locked out because of that. More broadly, you should probably strongly push people only to employ, or only to make employment decisions based on job relevant characteristics. Um, if somebody has weird political views, or somebody has, um, has weird social views, um, or uh, or if, if somebody enjoys LARPing or, or something like that, we, we don't want people making, uh, making job decisions based on these characteristics and, and unless they somehow are job relevant. And there are some people who are really, really weird and maybe if it, if it ends up being disruptive in the workplace um, because they behave very, very differently from other people, you might consider that uh, in terms of whether to keep them around or not. But Generally speaking, pulling, uh, pulling people away from inappropriate employment decisions and pulling them towards job-relevant um, employment decisions, that's a good thing. It's, it's good for a diverse society in many ways, but it's particularly relevant for unchangeable categories. Um, it's also generally a good idea for religious ideas, uh, I mean, for uh, or for re uh, religious criteria, and that's not necessarily the only. Um, it's not necessarily entirely deciding. Like we wouldn't demand that churches hire uh, hire Buddhists to um, to work as preachers. That that would be weird, and it would be uh, inappropriate because it destroys the messaging ability. And so there are some nuances uh, that need to be dealt with, but generally speaking, um, uh, job-related decisions should, um, uh, they should, they should come from job-relevant uh, characteristics, and those should be reasonably narrowly construed. So, uh, in particular, uh, so another statement that, um, that Morgan Freeman made is that um, Black History Month is uh, irrelevant, um, that uh, there is no separate black history, there's just history and black people have always been part of that. And I think that's generally a fair statement. I'm wary of 
explicit celebration uh, of diversity, except when I think it, it's acting to bust down a taboo. And I don't think I don't think that taboo actually exists in a strong enough way to justify uh, that kind of uh, separate treatment of uh, uh, of black history or any other uh, ethnic histories. So I'm not absolutely certain on this, and so this is an area where I might be willing to be argued. Uh, but my current impression is that it's whether it ever was uh, a positive thing, it's no longer necessary. Uh, or perhaps it never was necessary. So I'm inclined to agree with him uh, on that, uh, just in the sense that like, you you could have a number of separate celebrations for uh, various uh, categories in almost any field. You could have a black chemistry uh, month, you could have a um, uh, women in computing month, and you could certainly, you could find people to to highlight during these times but at least hopefully in the end we wouldn't need to because they're just flat out part of history uh, in, a, in a multicultural society or even in times when it wasn't so multicultural they were still uh, part of it. Like uh, Ada Lovelace for example was is generally considered to be uh, either the first programmer or one of the fir first programmers and in computer science, she's honored. Uh, there's a programming language called Ada that's named after her. Um, do we need to separately celebrate her? Probably not. Although this doesn't mean, for example, that there aren't uh, some fields that have become dominated by one uh, uh, by one category uh, over the others, and it's probably helpful to have a limited set of institutions that will s that might serve to redress that uh, for a limited time. But I'm generally pretty wary of them, particularly when they end up forming their own uh, social norms. Uh, because anytime, and I've covered this in, in other videos, anytime you end up really having qualified uh, cultures, those cultures will, uh, or they often uh, lose touch for, uh, with uh, with the mainstream and they easily become radicalized and lose touch with reality. Uh, they, they develop a monoculture and that's not healthy. So <clears throat> yeah, I'm inclined to agree with Freeman uh, uh, on that. Now, I'm not going to comment in depth uh, about this, but if you... Um, If you like reading challenging, uh, challenging works on these topics, you, you might want to t uh, take a look at Bill Cosby's uh, Pound Cake speech. And you, you heard me typing a second ago. I was just uh, making sure that uh, I got the name of it, uh, the, uh, the name of it right. And yes, I, I have read the, the thing and commented on, uh, on it before, I think in my blog. But um, but the the pound cake speech is a it's a piece of self criticism by C uh, Bill Cosby of various parts of uh, the black community uh, in America to the extent that it is one community uh, anyhow um, and uh, he's talking uh, about productive changes in cultural norms and expectations in society. It was controversial when he said it. It's still controversial today. It's worth looking at, but the lessons that uh, that you can get from it, just like most of the lessons in life, they're not specific to the black community. And uh, most of the failings and difficulties and conflicts that you'll see in humanity, they're completely general. The specifics may vary, but the, the patterns and problems uh, they probably have, uh, any problem that you could name probably has occurred with a very different group uh, at least 40 or 50 times throughout history, if not many, many more. So um, I hope this has been an interesting, perhaps provocative, perhaps not, um, conversation about uh, 
about race and uh, and gender norms. At, at, well, no, I haven't covered gender norms, uh, but about race and gender in society. I'd be happy to uh, continue the conversation in the comments for a little while. So if you have something to say, um, uh, say it. If you disagree, just keep it civil. And if you agree, also keep it civil. So that's the end of this video. I'll see you in the next one.